Okay. Hello, CRIM1 students. I'm excited to welcome you to this session because we have a very special guest. Sheila Gallagher-Price is the College of Social Sciences liaison at the Career Development Center. And she just has a wealth of knowledge about resumes, interviewing careers. And today she's gonna to be talking about resume preparation. And we'll also touch on interviewing and career readiness, but we have a separate presentation on that for you as well. So Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Hughes, for including me in this recording. I appreciate that. Um, today, we are gonna discuss how to do a resume. And I think it's important that we talk about layout and all that good stuff, because what I have found in my presentations, um, in classroom presentations, the majority of students will Google a resume template, which limits you on the amount of information or the layout in which your resume is, is done or how much um, control you have over the document. So I like to start off by saying, I think it's important that students create a resume in a Word document where you have control over the font size, the layout, the margins, and all of that good stuff. So let's get started. The thing that you wanna ask yourself when you're doing a resume is what's the message you're trying to convey and to showcase the skills and experience relevant to the job that you're applying to. And the reason why I say relevant to the job you're applying to is I find students tend to use a one size fits all resume. And let's face it, not all jobs are the same. In fact, no two jobs are the same. Each job looks for a different set of um, skill set or experience. So what is important is that you tailor your resume to each and every job that you're applying to. It's kind of a full-time job looking for a full-time job after graduation. You are, my suggestion is always uh, what I tell students in the classroom is create a file, print out the job description so you remember what they're looking for print out the resume that you used for that particular job application so that you can refer to it when you're called upon to do an interview. And so that you'll remember what you listed so that you know what to talk about. And I think that's so important just to, to really know the position you're applying for, right. what they're looking for, so you can talk in detail, in specific information when they ask you questions. Exactly. And the feedback that I am getting, by the way, from employers is that Students sometimes don't know what they're applying to because they don't recollect or remember. And I always, when we talk about interviewing, which is another classroom presentation, but what I tell students is refresh your memory about what it was they were looking for, what it was you indicated in your resume, because it was clearly something that they were liking and matching because they're bringing you now in for an interview. So just kind of refresh your memory on what it was you indicated on that resume. Now here is the resume template that the Office of the Career Development Center recommends using. There is no, and, and Dr. Hughes, let me preface this by saying, there is no right or wrong, but there are better ways to showcase information that employers are looking for. And the reason, oh, I'm sorry. This template is available on the Career Development Center website? Correct. And I'll show you after um, that it is located in the Career Success Guide that is full of wealth of information that is helpful, not only in resumes, interviewing, grad school app applying, personal statement, how to prepare for interviews, questions asked, all kinds of good stuff. But what I am going to say about this template is we didn't, the Career Development Center didn't just say, this is the one that we recommend you using. We subscribe to the National Association of Colleges and Employers nationwide. It is a national organization that we belong to. And every three, about three to five years, they will survey employers across all industries across the nation to get their feedback on the order or the layout in which they want to see information on the resume. And this is why I always say it's much easier to control the layout 
in a Word document because you're actually creating it based on the layout that we're showing you here. And then what we'll do in this discussion today is go in and break out into each of the sections of the resume and how you're going to showcase it and, and talk about it. So the first and foremost, the biggest font size on the resume page should be your name. I have seen where names are the same as the rest of the resume. I have seen that it's 20 font size and the rest of the resume is maybe 10. I have seen that it is slightly bigger yet off to the side. I will say this, your name shouldn't be any larger than 18 font size. And when I say 18, you can bold it, that's fine, but it shouldn't compete with the subheadings in your resume. It should stand out to the person reading it so they know whose resume it is. And then after that, you're gonna include your name, address, phone number, email, all of that right under your name. I think it's important that we talk about layout um, because depending on how much information you have on the resume itself would determine the layout of that information, uh, contact information about yourself. Primarily as a senior or as a junior going into your senior year, you're going to find that you're going to gain more experience either through internships or work experience or volunteer experience or any clubs or organizations that you belong to. So the first example is the example that would take up the least amount of space and is the cleanest. Um, but as a freshman coming in, you may not have much uh, experience at this point in your career. So you can take up um, multiple lines by laying it out this way. The resume itself, and we'll get into the fine points of it towards the end of the presentation, but generally speaking, it shouldn't be longer than a page. That was um, my question for you. So really aiming for that one page so it's not too arduous for an employer to look right. through it, they can see it quickly. Correct. Now, I do tell students because now, unlike when I was graduating from college today, a lot of social media is used and networking to connect with people who are in the industry or doing the job that you're interested in doing. So what we tell students today is they don't need to know your home address. All that's important is that you list the city and state that you currently live in. They're mm -hmm. gonna reach out to you, usually by email, very rarely, but they can reach out through LinkedIn or any of the social media networks that we encourage you to create a network with, especially LinkedIn. Studies show that 90% of hires are not necessarily the old fashioned job posting and applicants apply. It's more of a networking, who knows whom directs you to somebody else. You start talking to the individual and they encourage you to apply. So 90% are done that way today. That's really interesting. So you do recommend that students set up a LinkedIn page and put it on the on the resume. Absolutely. And another great thing, uh, Dr. Hughes, about LinkedIn is you can actually connect with alumni from Fresno State who are in the field doing what you hope to be doing and ask them how they got their start. They yeah. want to talk to you about it. Right. That's great advice. And of course, the important thing is if you're putting it on your resume, you need to make sure you're monitoring that site because if someone is reaching out to you via LinkedIn and you're not checking, you might miss an opportunity. Absolutely. So good point. Make sure that you, along with the phone number that has a voice bo a mailbox set up, mm -hmm. they may reach out to you via phone and make sure that you have a professional sounding message. Um, and that your voicemail is set up or isn't full. They're going to move on to the next candidate if they can't get in touch with you. But generally speaking, they're going to email you, reach out via email, and make sure that your email that you are using is one that you're checking on the regular. Because at some point after you graduate, your Fresno State email address is going to go away. And it does need to be a professional sounding email address. Like Absolutely. I said in the notes, yeah. 
So the next section after your contact information is going to be um, your highlights summary section. I will say this, um, depending on who you talk to, even within our office, some have an opinion on whether this should be used versus a skills and qualifications section that I recommend using. And the only reason that I recommend the skills and qualifications section versus the highlights and summary, if unless you're a really, really clear and effective writer, it can get bogged down. And I've read some where you're reiterating everything in the resume in that highlight summary section. And that is not what we want to do in this section. Um, some will put objectives. I personally think, and the employers that I talk to say, we don't read objective statements. That's mm -hmm. kind of 1990s, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of archaic. Um, they'll either read a skills and qualification section or a highlight summary section. And if you are going to use the highlight summary section, make sure that you kind of hit or touch upon these um, things that we're talking about. Experience or relevant work to the job you're applying in either internship, summer job service, learning volunteer activities or such. Related special projects, maybe you were involved in a research project, right? You're also going to include that in the experience section of your resume, but you can touch upon it in this highlight summary. Um, what I generally see is instead of this section, students will do a cover letter. I see that highlights all of these same things. But as you're saying, even if you include most of these things in the highlight section, they also need to go in the appropriate section of the resume as well. Correct. Excellent. Yes. And again, I can't stress, if they don't ask for a cover letter, we recommend that you do one. It's going to be this highlight summary, and we'll go into that towards the end of the, the presentation today. But whenever, when in doubt, include a cover. This is the section I prefer most. It highlights what it is you're bringing to the table as far as skills and qualifications, experiences. Mm -hmm. And it touches upon those um, sections that you're really strong in or proficient in, or can demonstrate in the experience section where you've actually utilized these skills. I can't tell you, Dr. Hughes, the number of students who speak a foreign language and don't indicate it on their resume. And that's so important to highlight. I agree. They're gonna remember it. They're, when they hire you, they're gonna go, oh, I remember when Sheila indicated that she could speak another language and she can help the customers better than I can because I don't, right? And so if you can speak a, another language, also include whether you can interpret and translate as well. It's very important. Not only can I speak it, but I can interpret when necessary and translate to someone who doesn't. I see. So make it very clear what your language abilities are. Correct. Certainly uh, indicate here um, what career rep readiness skills, and we'll go into what those are. And Dr. Hughes mentioned early at the presentation that there is a separate presentation on career readiness skills. It happens to be what employers across all industries are looking for. And it's something that you've acquired in all your jobs and don't realize that you have them. So we're gonna touch upon what career readiness skills are today. And I see this a lot. I just want to point this out. A lot of times students will list that they are um, proficient in Microsoft Word or Office or um, spreadsheets. I have had students come back to me at, that has said in an interview, they've actually asked them to demonstrate their skill set. So, wow. right? It's one thing to say you have it. Be prepared to demonstrate it if at all, whenever possible, in an interview, they may ask you. That's so important to be aware of that you might get called out. So, And they're going to catch you whether <laughs> you actually meant what you said or not. That's their way of weeding through, right? 
The next section that you're gonna indicate is the ed education section. One thing that I wanna point out here in this um, conversation today is everything is listed in reverse chronological order, starting with your most recent degree, which is going to be here at Fresno State. Now, I ask this of students when I present the classroom and today I don't have the audience, but I will say, do you know the official name of your university? I'm so glad you're asking this question. It's as it's going to be listed on your diploma. I get a lot of, oh, we're Fresno State or we're Fresno State University or with CSUF. The answer is we are California State University comma Fresno. We used to once upon a time, and we're going way back when I was a student here, we used to be known as CSUF, but guess who else is CSUF? Bulletin. Yes, and they took it from us. So that's when we became Fresno State as the nickname. But what we tell students is always address your university by its official name which is California State University Fresno. And in parentheses, after you list it formally, you can put Fresno State and then refer to Fresno State in the body of your resume. And the important thing is it's not Fresno State University, Correct. it's Fresno State. <laughs> Correct. And I get that a lot. Um, and the reason why is you could be someone living on the East Coast and no one who isn't familiar with Fresno State knows that Fresno State, California State University, Fresno are one in the same. It's a nickname that we go by that we've adopted. It is nationally recognized in athletics, but our formal name will always remain California State University, Fresno. The other question that I get asked is, should I list my community college even if I didn't get an AA or an AS? The answer to that is no. If you did not get an AA or an AS degree, there's no reason to list it. You're going to provide official transcripts at the point of um, being hired. But there are ways to showcase information that maybe you took a class that you want that employer to know that you've been exposed to in the classroom, some experience that they're looking for. There is a section that we're gonna go into where you can list coursework that's relevant to the job. But in this particular case, unless you wanna showcase a certificate that you may have received or the GPA, and even at that point, the GPA can be highlighted in the awards or recognition section and not be listed in the education section. Also, I see when you've mentioned degree, it's really important that students know that the criminology and forensic behavioral science majors are Bachelor of Science degrees, BS oh. degrees, not BA degrees. Exactly. And the other thing that I see that I want to point out, good, good point, Dr. Hughes, is you're not getting a major in victimology. Yes. You're getting a major in criminology with the option in victimology. Or law enforcement or corrections. Correct. Yes. So make sure that you list it as criminology being your official major. Or forensic behavioral sciences. Correct. With comma, with the option that you're getting, law enforcement, criminal, um, victimology, or um, corrections. corrections. If you're in forensic behavioral sciences, obviously there's no option. It's one major. And the first time you should write it all out, forensic behavioral sciences, then you can put parentheses FBS to refer to it by that abbreviation later on, if you wish. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Here are some examples on how to lay that out in the education section. I will say this, the GPA is very important to indicate if it's about a three, two or higher. Now, you're saying, what if I have a three, oh, you can have a strong three, oh, GPA and have more activities and things to highlight on the resume. It's okay. If you've made the president's list, I have seen where students have listed out each semester that they've, you don't need to list each semester you've made president's list or each semester you've made dean's list. What is important is go ahead and notate it 
you can even indicate the number of semesters in which you received it, but know this, on your official transcripts, it will be indicated each semester that you've received the president or dean's list. So again, going back to the community college, make sure that you either put associate of science or associate of arts, or you can even list it as an A period, A period, or A period, S period. But whatever you do here is gonna be consistent with what you do at pres uh, your higher um, degree at Fresno State, which would be either a B period, S period, or yeah, in this case, all of them would be a BS. Make sure that they're consistent in both college is how you list it out. I always say put your graduation date as far on the right margin as possible so that it's easier for the reader, the employer, can it stands out to them and they can easily see when you plan on graduating. If you're not graduating till May of 2025, put the word expected just like we've done here. That lets the reader know when you do plan on graduating. What I do see, and you don't need to do this, is the date range of attendance. Now, Dr. Schweitzer and I don't agree on this. He thinks it's important that you do list the date range, but the law enforcement agencies that I've spoken to locally say no. So maybe for a state agency or a federal agency job, they may want to know the dates of attendance especially with the FBI that just that I just brought to campus a couple weeks ago, actually last month. They do want to see the dates of attendance because they want to know what you were doing when you weren't in college. Right. They want to know is, you were there. So there are exceptions to the rule and okay. those agencies will let you know what they are looking for. Um, I get asked this periodically. Do I need to list high school diploma? The answer is no. At this point in your career, as you are getting ready to graduate from Fresno State, you don't need to indicate a high school a diploma. Even if you're wanting to showcase a GPA, I always list that in the honors and awards section of the resume if room allows. What is more important to the reader, the employer, is that they see the experience that you've gained and acquired. Okay, so don't take up valuable space with your high school information unless you think it's really important. That's right. Dr. Hughes, I call it valuable real estate. <laughs> That's a good way of looking they, at it. Right? They want to know what it is, the skill sets that you've acquired or utilized, rather than what degrees you've gotten or the GPA from high school. Now we're getting into the meat and potatoes part of the resume, and it's really important. I, I got to keep track of time. So Dr. Hughes, please tell me if I'm getting close. I think it's important that we spend an amount of time here in this section because this is what employers are looking for to determine whether they're going to take you to the next level, which would be the interview level. The thing that you want to indicate is the the job title you were given in your experience section. I think it's important to highlight that versus the employer you work for. So put your title of your position first, the employer's name second, and the city and state that you worked. So it could be Starbucks. So you would put Barista, Starbucks Incorporated or whichever, and then in Fresno, whatever location, you don't have to put the cities or the address of the location, but Fresno, California, Clovis, California, Madera, California, wherever it was you worked. Um, but when you go into describing what it is you do, what I generally tell students is take a blank piece of paper. From the moment you are on the job, to the moment you leave, write down every single thing that you do. If it's prep work, if it's working collaboratively with others, what it is you're doing and how, with how many. If you were a shift lead and you were training others or you're overseeing them, 
how many do you train on a regular basis, like weekly, monthly, annually? How many are in your team and what it is you might train them on? If it's, if it's following company guidelines, if it's creating more efficient ways of doing things because you're streamlining the process, even if it's utilizing career readiness skills, here it is again, it's popped back up. Career readiness skills, it's important that you articulate what skills you're using while performing that job. So it sounds like it's important to keep a job journal so that you know what you've done. And then, you know, a couple of years later, when you're looking back, you have a reminder and then you can put that into your resume. Exactly. Exactly. Because I, I can't tell you the number of students, Dr. Hughes, that I speak with, and they'll either say, well, I didn't really do that much. Really? OK, let's talk about it. What did you do the first thing when you get there? What is it you're doing in your four hour shift? Are you doing just that? No, well, no, I'm actually doing this and this simultaneously. Oh, so you're good at multitasking. So then you can see all the skills and abilities you have that will be valuable to this new potential employer. Right. And the last bullet point, it's important that you develop the story for the reader to get a clear picture of what it is you do. And the reason why I point out this last bullet point, it may be last, but it is one of the most important um, bullet points on this page, because what you're doing is creating a storybook, if you will, or a picture that the person reading the resume actually has a clear visual idea of what it was you were challenged with. What action did you take every day in that job to complete or get the outcome or results that you got, that you were hired to do? And so can you just clarify again what C-A-R stands for? Absolutely. So C is for challenge. So let's say I'm a barista and I have to get a drink made in 2.5 minutes or 2.5 seconds. I'm working with a team of three. I take the order, someone makes the order, and then someone brings me the order. So that's the action that we're taking as part of a three-person team. We take the order, make the order, and get it out to the customer in 2.5 seconds. And the result is the customer hopefully leaves happy. So how much detail should someone go into about this on your resume? Because now I'm thinking the whole page is going to be. <laughs> it should be. There should be as much detail. And that's where I come in. You can meet with me or any of our career fair mentors, and we can pare it down to get it clearly, concisely stated. But take as much room as you need to get the story across so that the reader has a clear understanding of what you did every day in that job. And then we will pare it down. We will work with you to pare it down and streamline it to make it as clearly, concisely written so that it still is conveyed to the reader as minimal as possible. So better to start with more detail and then you can help pick out what the highlights should be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because when I meet with students, Dr. Hughes, mm -hmm. I tend to find that you all downside, sell mm -hmm. yourself. You don't think you play a critical role in the job that you were hired to do. When in fact, you play a very critical, important role to make the operation of that company successful. Remember, don't sell yourself short. And this is the time to emphasize all your achievements and what you accomplished. Correct. It's your 10 point seconds. It takes the reader to decide whether they're going to interview you or not to brag about yourself. Mm -hmm because no one else is going to brag about you, but you. As long as it's truthful and honest and you can Correct. pull people up, let them know what you've done. Oh, and trust me, they've interviewed enough candidates in their time to know who's fibbing and who's actually can demonstrate the skills that they said they have. Yeah. So I mentioned career readiness skills. Any idea that what career readiness skills are to you? These are actually a set of skills that you've acquired in all areas of your life 
that you can take with you from one job to the next. You're acquiring them in the classroom. You're acquiring them in your internship or volunteer experience. You're actually doing them in your work experience. And you ask, what are those career readiness skills? These are the top eight skill sets that employers look for in any industry, in any job. And you will see these listed in the job description of the job you're applying to. Any combination of these eight. How many times do you see must demonstrate effective communication skills? I guarantee you, you're gonna see them almost in every job description that you're reading. And those skills are actually ones that you're utilizing every day in the classroom. Let's say you have a class project you're working on in a team. If you don't communicate effectively with each other, guess what? The project will fall apart because someone didn't know what they were supposed to do. Yes, and you have to show that you've worked together successfully. Correct. So you're not only using effective communication skills, you're actually using teamwork, collaborative skills. You are a lead shift crew leader and you're training others that you work for. Guess what? You're demonstrating leadership skills. This skill right here, critical thinking, is a skill set that employers and law enforcement specifically, most importantly, are looking for when they interview students. And the reason why they're looking for this skill is you've got to outthink the perpetrator or the person you're dealing with before they even do it. So you're analyzing the situation instantly and you're assessing it in your mind to anticipate what they may or may not do. And every time you write an essay, take an exam, you're engaged in critical thinking. So Excellent. that's really being emphasized in the classroom. So the top, to give you an example, the top three skill sets that law enforcement um, agencies that I've talked to over my career here at, in the Career Development Center at Career Fair say they're looking for effective communication skills because you're going to be writing a lot of police reports. And if you can't write effectively, concisely, precisely, then it's not helpful to the person who's building the case against the perpetrator or the person that you've just and that's the important thing to emphasize is the communication. It's oral and written communication. Mm. Excellent. Yes. And you're also talking to your sergeant, your leader, whatever just happened. Critical thinking skills is the number two. And number three, they look at leadership skills and collaboration as a tie. Someone who's going to take the lead, but someone who works well with a partner on the, on the um, beat or the law enforcement area of the career. We just went over the car story. Here it is again, challenge, action, results. Be sure and take a screenshot of this so that you have it as a reference when you're writing your resume. I can't tell you how important it, this is in parlaying what it is you did in your past or prior experiences. And what section does this information go in? Does it go in the appropriate section for whether it's internship, whether it was work experience? It's funny, you should ask. I list all of that under the heading experience. Okay. Some may break it out. If they can demonstrate leadership, they sometimes will break it out under leadership experience to kind of stand out to the reader. Look at me, I have leadership experience. I was president of a club or organization. I was in charge of a crew at my job. I did trainings for new hires, or you can list volunteer experience if you have a lot of it. Generally, what I tell students is just put the category as experience and list it all. You can sub categorize it by saying volunteer work and internship or leadership or whatever it is you're trying to convey. And as you're pointing out, again, it doesn't have to be just in a kind of traditional job setting. You maybe took on a role in a student club. All of that is really important and valid experience. Absolutely. Don't 
sell yourself short. Anytime you engaged in any activities, maybe it's a class project. That class project should be listed in this experience section as its own category even. Describe what the project was. What were you challenged to do? How did you collect? What action did you take on that project to get the outcome or results? And what did you do with that outcome or results? Did you present it in the classroom? Did you give it to your professor who then used it in their research project? Those are the questions you want to answer when you describe that class project. So then you write a paragraph, which you then convert to uh, sort of bulleted statements, or do you have both a, a paragraph and bulleted statement? I personally will use a bullet point, but describe in detail what it is I do. That's what I tell students. Kicking it off with an action verb. Led, created, initiated, modified, resolved, whatever the challenge was that you were given at work. Maybe you streamlined a process. Maybe you wrote a training manual for all the new hires. That's a big deal. Yep. That takes time. Maybe you save the company money by streamlining a process, making it quicker for whatever it was you were doing, serving the community, the customer, the public, whatever. These are the questions that they're going to be asking. Can this individual candidate save me money, make me money, make work easier, solve a problem? There is your critical thinking. If it's in law enforcement, the questions they may be asked is, how detailed was the report written? Was it clear to me, the sergeant, that I could read and get a complete picture of what actually transpired or took place? Being observant, you observe things while pulling that individual suspect over. All of that should be in the report. The more information in the report, the more the sergeant, and if it ever goes to the DA's office or whatever, the clearer the picture is in their case, they're building. Think about those kinds of things. And again, the career readiness skills. These are what employers are looking for. These are things that you're acquiring every day and don't realize maybe that you are utilizing in the classroom, in your volunteer work or internship experience. Now I mentioned honors and awards, if room allows, and you can see why maybe you run out of room. Although this section is important, Dr. Hughes, it's not the be all end all that will determine whether you get an interview rather than the meat and potatoes of the resume is the experience. So if you do not have room for this section, you can work with me or our career peer mentor in our office to find ways to be creative in inserting this into other sections of your resume without creating a new category or subheading. So that you can still get the material in there but not take up too much space. Correct. Make sure that you indicate your associations, especially if you held a position. If you were involved in any service projects or campus activities, dog days or vintage days or anything of that nature, or maybe you were part of traffic operations on campus, those kinds of things are very important to include in the resume as well. I always say, don't use any font size smaller than 11. For those of us that can't see very well that have teeters, it's easier on the eyes. Your subcategories could be, or your categories can be no larger than 14 font size. And of course your name's gonna be the largest at 16 to 18 font size. I will say this though, I have seen bolded, underlined, colored, you name it, I would only ask it's best that you not italicize, underline, bold, everything in the resume, because at some point they all look the same and they don't even know where the, to go to look. I simply say bold the categories. It's okay. 
And then the other will glean out as the reader reads through it. Um, now, yes. So these days, a lot of resumes are submitted electronically, but obviously it's always going to be important to have paper copies as well. If you're going to a careers event, um, there are going to be employees there. Is it recommended that you have resumes with you to be able to hand out to an employer at the table? Good point. Absolutely. Have your resume print out at least 10 to 15. Know who the agencies are going to be there. You've got the Criminology Career Fair coming up. And you're going to want to network with a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies across the state. So you're going to want to have a lot of copies of your resume ready to hand out. The one point you just made that a lot of companies are now doing or agencies is they are electronically reading resumes. The thing that I want to make clear here is whatever keywords or phrases are in the job description are very, very important to them. And they're going to program the electronic reader to pick up those keywords or phrases. So make sure that when you are reading a job description, that you actually incorporate word for word the what they've used in the announcement, but be prepared to demonstrate it in your experience section. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, so that if a non-human entity is doing the initial reading of these resumes, you wanna make sure that you've got the key words in there will, which will advance your resume to a human. Correct. So don't lie, this is where they'll catch you. Don't say it because they're looking for it. Connect the dots for the reader. Say it in the skills and qualifications, but actually insert it in the experience where you utilize that skill set. And that's going to blow the reader away. They're going to go, oh, not only does she say she speaks another language, here's where she utilized that other language in her job. Right. So there's more evidence. And do you think, um, while important as it is to have a cover letter, if resumes are being reviewed by some kind of AI system, that might not be reading the cover letter as well. It's really important that you have those keywords in the actual resume in case the cover letter is not reviewed. Absolutely. When in doubt, do a cover letter, but make sure that in your resume, those keywords or phrases are in there so that when it is electronically sent, it'll pick up those keywords or phrases. I can't tell you the number of companies that are now going in that direction. Shouldn't be any longer than one single page. Make sure it's readable and make sure it's grammatically correct. Correct spelling, punctuation, use of words, all that good stuff. When in doubt, have someone else take a look at it. We tend to not see there and there used differently. It won't pick it up if you're using the correct there or if you're using the incorrect there. Um, don't refer to yourself in third person and everything is reverse chronological order with your most recent first. We talked about cover letters. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. It's as fast as this. And I wished I would have known this when I was in college and we didn't cover it and more and more were asking for it at the time. A cover letter is simply a way of displaying your writing ability, believe it or not. They're testing you to see how well you write. I hear that on campus jobs. I hear that with uh, employment after with law enforcement agencies. They will ask you for a writing sample. This is your writing sample. Make sure that you introduce yourself. You highlight your personality and it gleams through. You are actually getting the, the reader prepared to read the resume without going all into it and reiterating it. And it talks about your personal style, your work ethic. And yes, always include a cover letter. Opening, there are three paragraphs. It's as simple as that. First paragraph is how you heard about the job. You happen to be looking at their job site. You met with them at the career fair. You're interested in applying for that position. You're going to talk about and, and highlight your qualifications 
about what it is they were looking for and what it is you're bringing to the table. Remember, it's not what you can do for them. I mean, I'm sorry, I had that reverse. Remember, it's not what they can do for you, but what you can do for them. They're in the business of looking for someone that's going to fit what it, their needs are. So talk about your skill set in relationship to what they're looking for. And then close, the last paragraph is as simply as, I look forward to discussing with you more in depth my skills and qualifications that are bringing. I think we'd be a good fit. I'm excited to meet with you to discuss further. In the career six, and let me, let me tell you this, this is my contact information before I take you to where the career success guide is. Feel free to take a screenshot, reach out to me, email me, or I would simply, if you don't have a resume already started, meet with a career pair mentor first in our office. We are located on the third floor of the old University Student Union, and we have career uh, peer mentors on staff Monday through Friday, eight to five. And they'll get you started. And then you can reach out to me once you have a rough draft done and we can fine tune it. But what I do wanna show you is, let's get out of this here. It won't let me stop sharing. Let me get out. I think because we're recording. There we go. Real quickly on our website, for those who have been to the website, it is careercenter.fresnostate.edu and down on our homepage on 24 seven resources is the career success guide. I think it's important that every student download this as a PDF and you can actually see resume samples for your use to look at, to see how they worded them. That's so helpful to see an example like that. And we also have cover letter samples as well. So in addition to that, you'll see the cover letter sample that I just went over and some various samples on how to articulate it. So I thank you today for allowing me to talk about what the Career Development Center has to offer and about getting you started in your resume. Well, thank you, Sheila, for sharing so much valuable information. I always learn so much when I get to hear you talk about resume writing and you're so familiar with the current trends and developments in the field. And so you're so well positioned to advise our students. And I think the crucial thing for students to take away is there is so much help available on campus. Absolutely. So someone's feeling overwhelmed right now. Like, how do I start with my resume? You've already said there are peer mentors in the Career Development Center that can help with this, and then they can meet with you and go over and refine the resume. So there is no reason not to have an outstanding resume during your time at Fresno State. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.